Hello, my name is Brendan Wolf. I am the uh, marketing manager for OpenStack at NetApp. Uh, welcome to our presentation this morning, 9 a.m. on a Thursday morning. I'm glad to see people coming in. I'm going to be co-presenting with Rob Esker. Uh, he's our product manager for OpenStack at NetApp. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit today about NetApp's commitment to the OpenStack community and what does OpenStack mean for NetApp in our portfolio moving forward. <clears throat> NetApp has been um, a major contributor to OpenStack for a few years now. Um, we've, uh, I think this is our eighth summit, ninth summit, something like that. Um, and we've, we've come a long way. Uh, we're the number one provider, storage provider for OpenStack today. Um, and we have quite a few uh, customer deployments. And we're going to talk about some of the, those use cases uh, a little bit further in the presentation. Um, NetApp's vision around OpenStack um, has to do with how do we manage our data between the mini cloud ecosystem that we're dealing with today. Uh, people want to have their data available when they need it and where they need it, um, have strong uh, data management controls, but they still want to take advantage of this mini cloud ecosystem. That's what we're calling the Net NetApp data fabric vision. In order to enable that NetApp data fabric vision, you need to have a common uh, set of APIs between all these different cloud services, which is why OpenStack is a really good fit and uh, a strategic uh, place of investment for NetApp today. Um, under or over, depending on, on the provider, each of these clouds NetApp storage can sit. Um, we, we, uh, we've done a lot of work in our driver set across the portfolio in order to pass through a lot of our enterprise features <clears throat> to, make, to make them uh, available through this, this cloud uh, ecosystem and enable that data fabric vision that I was uh, talking about before. So sometimes the question comes up, um, why does enterprise storage matter for uh, OpenStack? Uh, we're going to go through uh, several stories today to explain why we think that matters. Um, but Essentially, we can uh, categorize most of that into to, to four major quadrants. Um, your, your data and your storage needs to be flexible, needs to be efficient, needs to be secure, and it needs to be proven. And all of these things need to be built with OpenStack in mind. Um, and then we also need to classify people into um, a few categories in order to understand what's driving OpenStack adoption today. Um, I, hopefully, most of you in the, in the room will see yourselves a little bit in each of these pillars. Um, they're not entirely comprehensive, but it gives us a, a reference point in order to start having this conversation because uh, people are approaching this for different reasons. You might be an enterprise customer where your, your major concerns are things like availability, TCO, and avoiding vendor lock-in. You might be uh, building a, a web, web scale architecture where you're, you're, you're trying to um, build out a large system where ease of operation uh, and density become your, your primary concerns. If you're a service provider, it might be SLAs and differentiation for how, how, do you, uh, how, how do you compete against the, the other players in the market. Or you might be in DevOps, building cloud-native applications where you're worried about open APIs, elasticity, and, and uh, the ag agility to bring your products to market faster. OpenStack addresses each of these pillars in a, a little bit of a different way. Um, and on the storage side, we are trying to target these uh, potential customers and build these kinds of features into our products. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rob. He's going to talk a little bit about um, how we've been successful so far. Thanks. Hey, good morning. Uh, so as Brennan mentioned, I'm Rob Esker, uh, product manager. I uh, do a little bit of strategy work around OpenStack. Started the effort at NetApp 2011, actually end of 2010, technically. So I've been at this for a while. I think it's actually my ninth or possibly my 10th summit. Um, so it's interesting seeing the evolution. And by the way, I commend everybody here in the room at 9 a.m. Uh, night or morning after a typical night of parties. So uh, appreciate your attention on this. I uh, wanted to point out the OpenStack Foundation's user survey. So that's, this is published every six months, uh, usually in the week just ahead of the summit. So again, true uh, this particular cycle. So end of last week, um, the, the foundation uh, publish the latest results, and this is consistent with what we've seen before. Uh, amongst the sort of commercial storage vendors, amongst the enterprise reliable storage vendors, we're consistently number one. We actually increased our lead this particular time. 
Now you'll note, you know, stuff is certainly very, very prevalent. And uh, for a lot of sensible reasons, it's usually very easy to get started with it. We're starting to see a little bit of a trend, which is kind of interesting, which is, you know, I, I, I got OpenStack stood up. I have a certain set of cloud native applications that are deployed atop it. Uh, Ceph can perform you know, within these particular set of characteristics, but in order to fulfill the complete vision of you know, our cloud mission, uh, we need to actually enter you know, additional set of capabilities that uh, augment, if you will, what, what Ceph can do. It's you know, perhaps maybe more aligned with a no or low SLO or a certain different performance tier, but I need to actually move more of sort of those pets into my cloud. Uh, I, uh, if you're familiar with that metaphor, I apologize if, if not. Uh, I need to move those classic applications, those high SLA applications, into it. Just want to point out again, we're we're you know explicitly called out there, but we also know um, that LVM and NFS contain some of our systems as well, where they're actually using those drivers instead of the NAP specific drivers. I I would like to point out though that um, we actually see we have a little bit. And I would say probably more accurate empirical way of measuring this. The user survey is, of course, self-reported. Uh, NetApp systems, uh, this is certainly true of our ONTAP-based systems, if you're familiar with them, and it will be true of our E-series systems in the uh, coming releases of OpenStack. We've instrumented our drivers, our Cinder drivers, such that, you know, as a deployer, if you've elected to phone home back to NetApp for support purposes, uh, there's a little bit of telemetry that's provided to us that indicates that this is being used with Cinder. And so we're able to actually fairly empirically measure adoption rates. And there's a couple of things happening. Um, we, we've seen a really steady growth in the number of actual total deployers. And by the way, you know, there's folks that come and go. So this is sort of an, an aggregate, a, uh, uh, a pretty significant uh, rise in the number of folks actually going to a production deployment status. But more significantly so, and I think really speaks to where OpenStack's at, now we're starting to see that ratio of systems to deployments grow significantly. We're seeing organic additional capacity growth, which is an indication generally that this is now becoming more and more of a production quantity. So that this, pay, by the way, if I go back further in time, uh, the, the curve is, is more or less consistent. So briefly, I want to touch upon the nature of our integrations. Um, I should probably mention that we have a whole a full spate of sessions that go into more specific detail on each of these topics, uh, some of which actually occurred a little earlier in the week. And of course, if you're not already familiar, all of these sessions are on YouTube. Uh, likewise, later on today, we've got a number of these that will um, focus in on these particular topic areas in greater depth. So what we want to do is provide a little bit more of an overview here in this particular session. Um, so our capabilities range again across block, object, and file, and also augmenting the creation of instances, of creating Nova instances in a more efficient and performant way. So uh, let me actually, though, start with some, a new project that we're adding to, to OpenStack, um, namely Manila. So Manila, if you're not familiar with Cinder, is, or if you are familiar with Cinder, is essentially the same model, albeit for shared and distributed file systems. This is a capability that NetApp actually originally conceived of, uh, proposed within their Cinder community, and in the process of discussion in places like this at the design summits, uh, basically moved to a, a state where it was, it was settled upon. It really required its own separate service. Uh, so we've been actually working on, uh, in, you know, basically building a prototype, enhancing that, expanding upon it, building a community around it. So now there's uh, quite a few different Manila driver options uh, beyond, of course, NetApp's um, Cinder NFS, I'm sorry, Manila NFS, Manila um, SIS, and a couple of other derivations there. You also see it from other common NAS uh, um, vendors as well. And so we expect actually to expand again in the Liberty timeframe. But Manila, Manila it fills a pretty critical gap. Uh, if you look at OpenStack as the infrastructure as a open infrastructure as a service framework, I think it's firmly established itself. There has been a critical gap for infrastructure, namely treatment of and delivery of shared and distributed file systems in an as a service construct. So Manila addresses that. By the way, uh, this is an interesting sort of um, point. I think it might be the very first example of this, uh, but this is probably, uh, it, it's, it's notable to see that Amazon has launched uh, and announced 
a capability called EFS, Elastic File Storage, here in the last approximate month or so. And that's essentially Manila for Amazon. And that follows the evolution of Manila. I'm not suggesting they're using Manila, but it's the same construct. It fills the same set of gaps. So perhaps uh, the first incidence of Amazon starting to actually follow OpenStack instead of the other way around. <clears throat> so a, a common question is, well, where is Manila? Uh, you may be familiar that once upon a time within OpenStack, there was this notion of uh, you know, capabilities existed in sort of the you know, broad sort of nebulous set of projects, uh, not necessarily given specific distinction. Uh, that then you could apply and move into an incubated status, and from there you could actually move into an integrated status, and then potentially be designated as core. All that's gone. That doesn't exist anymore. So you may have heard of this big tent approach. Manila had achieved an incubated state at the beginning or at the end of the Juno cycle. Uh, Juno cycle. During Kilo, we, we significantly advanced its set of capabilities and matured it a great deal and would have been ready to move to that integrated state. But in the meantime, all of this sort of changed underneath us. It's moving to more of a tagging methodology. So uh, it's beyond the scope of this session to get into what all of that actually is, but just for your edification, we've got four out of those six tags already assigned to Manila. One of those is actually a legacy tag that will never apply to it. And over time, I think what you'll see is Manila proliferate via its availability in common distributions. We're working with the major distribution partners. Um, We've been working with them a number of months, and there's a lot of advancement just within the course of this week in describing how those will start to appear. I believe Red Hat already announced that it'll be part of their REL OSP distribution in the future and look for similar announcements from, for others. So uh, to answer the question of where is it at, it's ready um, for some uses, use cases now. We're going to try and achieve kind of that, uh, if you can think of it as kind of like the equivalent of a commercial 1.0 at the end of the Liberty cycle. So appeal to a broader set of capabilities and be better rounded out in terms of installation experience, documentation, uh, ongoing care and feeding. So that's where we're going with, with Manila and look for it in distributions in the not too distant future. So which brings us to Cinder. So I, I, I should probably start with saying that our strategy is to provide best in class integrations across the entirety of our portfolio, whether it's our ONTAP based hardware systems or for we don't have it depicted here on tap in a virtual form. So for example, um, we have a, a der derivation of our uh, operating system that has classically run on the, the filers you may have heard of from NetApp uh, that actually runs in clouds, the first example of which actually runs in AWS. These integrations I'm talking about in Cinder actually work with that as well as they work with cluster on tap as well as work with seven mode. E-Series is a platform. Uh, e and EF series, EF being an all flash uh, version of that. Um, we've also provided Cinder integrations. Uh, and uh, there's another platform that we've announced but not yet started shipping called Flashray that we also have a prototype uh, Cinder enablement for. And you can see that there's different sort of protocols we support. Uh, a, a notable addition of late is actually Fiber Channel for, for the types of uh, use cases environments where that's required. When, when we actually um, enable it via these protocols, we're also, within our drivers, unlocking uh, the distinguishing characteristics of that platform, some of which are just inherent to the box, but some of which are like specifically configured. Like Perhaps you've got an E-series system with uh, the largest available, slowest spinning, high capacity drives. Well, you probably arrange that into a Cinder catalog item that might be more archival. Or perhaps you put you know, an EF series, which is all flash because you need vast throughput, you might align that to more of kind of a streaming workload or an analytics workload. It's highly dependent. I should mention that in Cinder, all of these are arbitrary, these, these catalog capabilities. This is something we helped evolve within the Cinder community over time. You can establish whatever makes sense for you, you know, classically gold, silver, bronze. Maybe it's, maybe it's some other sort of more granular notion of what are these back-end capabilities. So... These are the protocol options on the right. On the left-hand side, we're trying to drive in our Cinder drivers those unique capabilities into Cinder so that you can create this catalog and distinguish from the different options and the different capabilities, deliver that to your tenant base. One capability that's kind of interesting in the, uh, in, uh, the ONTAP space is the ability to actually uh, integrate with Glance, uh, wherein you can actually um, D use our deduplication capabilities, get 90 plus percent deduplication rates, because you know, if you're not already familiar, 
Glance typically are guest virtual machine images, golden images, if you will. And it's uh, since we were talking about common OS bits, it deduplicates aggressively. Uh, and then likewise, um, once you've actually done that, we can actually create new instances in a very efficient manner. So uh, if, for example, I have like a RHEL image uh, that I want to actually boot, um, and I want to boot eight, eight instances associated with that, by default in, with Nova, that's actually going to copy that out, and it might actually end up in the extreme case as eight separate copies to eight separate compute nodes. Uh, we'll actually boot from volume and we'll clone from glance. That's an instantaneous operation and it's space efficient. Uh, so that's a, a cool capability we see in a lot of places. And just to a case in point, we recently did a, um, a performance characterization with, uh, in the process of validating something we call FlexPod, which we'll get into a little bit more here in just a bit. But um, what we end up doing. Uh, what we ended up doing is comparing uh, um, our results for creating new instances under those sort of cap cap characteristics or under those um, set of circumstances versus uh, another, you know, uh, well-known competitor here within the OpenStack community. Um, they published some of the results similarly, and you can see a very dramatic improvement overall uh, in instance creation time, uh, give, mostly attributed to, to that um, uh, to that instance creation cloning capability. I should mention that both systems are all, uh, actually the system on the left was all flash. The system, the NetApp system, in fact, wasn't. So briefly, I want to talk about Swift object storage. Uh, there's really basically two options presently. One is a storage grid web scale, and this is actually a new and emerging capability within, uh, within our portfolio specifically for Swift. I'm not suggesting that storage of web scale is entirely new. This is actually a, a product that's matured over time and that we've refactored in a pretty significant way for, for so many of the use cases that Swift would be deployed for. Uh, today, it already actually, um, uh, you can be used as a glance backend. Swift API and Keystone support are coming in, uh, in the future. I can't get into specifics about that, but not distant future. It already supports S3 and CDMI interfaces, so if it's the case you have app, Application workloads resident atop OpenStack that just want to talk to S3, well, you, you don't even need that Swift API support. Uh, we can deliver that in a web scale appliance. Actually, it's kind of a unique marriage between some of the, the structured web scale uh, capabilities and the characteristics of E series. Uh, we deliver a geodistributed erasure coding capability, and the scalability you can achieve are, are outstanding, especially when you look at what kind of some of the scaling limits are you hit with Swift proper. That said, I think Swift proper makes sense in a lot of use cases. And so we've also had a lot of success. I'll talk about one notable example in just a minute, where you actually just take upstream Swift and you, pro you make some, some tuning modifications. You, it's not modified. We're not talking about changing the code. That reduces the replication count based on a unique characteristic of that E-series platform I mentioned before, something we call dynamic disk pools. You can think of it as like erasure coding within the frame. And so what you get is the ability to actually run more of a classic parity scheme versus relying upon this inefficient consistent hashing ring approach. Long story short, I can think of an own example where a customer needed to deploy six petabytes of object, store, object storage. Uh, and by default in Swift, that would be 18 petabytes. When you look at like the parity overhead uh, with using our system, that would be about 7.8 petabytes. There are some other advantages um, beyond the obvious, you know, uh, uh, the fact that you don't have to actually deploy quite as much storage overall. It can actually also improve the scaling limitations of Swift because you've reduced a lot of that east-west traffic for replicas. So this is, again, another session later in the day where there'll be more detailed treatment. So let me get into um, some of the specifics of the use cases that, that Brendan had alluded to. Uh, and this is just a sampling. I wish I, we could talk about all of them. Uh, of that 484% growth, there's some really interesting names that, uh, as you might imagine, uh, don't necessarily, uh, uh, you know, appreciate being, or, or are not interested necessarily in sharing their story, perhaps for competitive reasons. But Thomson Reuters, there's a joint session we have uh, later today where we're going to talk about uh, their use for utility cloud capabilities. And in this particular case, I really want to talk about the fact that they're able to adapt existing databases as a service, existing sort of classic application, high SLA application uh, capabilities and requirements and make it available in an OpenStack construct. So this is something actually where we've, we've done some collaborative work, notably around Manila. And they now have Manila in a production state. 
uh, which is actually among the first in the world. So quite, quite interesting to learn more about that in that, that separate session. So uh, Deutsche Telekom, another interesting case. So they're going down the NFV path very aggressively. Um, you know, we've long been a primary provider to various different arms of, of Deutsche Telekom, and there's a lot of different OpenStack initiatives there that they've, they've discussed publicly. Uh, there's actually a separate session where we also talk about a collaboration there. Uh, likewise, we are using Manila, but it's beyond, it's kind of the whole suite of capabilities, although predominantly I should mention block and, and file. Uh, they'll talk about uh, the results of, of that collaboration, and I think where they're intending to go forward in another, another session. So uh, NHN Entertainment in Korea, uh, they have an uh, interesting uh, set of requirements. I've actually seen this a few times over, where they'll actually deploy an application out into a public cloud by default, typically. So what it, what it basically boils down to is I want to deliver a game title to the world of consumers. And I don't necessarily know exactly how much traction that will attain or will, will obtain. Um, so I want to put it in the place that has the lowest latency uh, connections to my potential consumer base. It's you know broadly distributed. It's very elastic because I don't I can't accurately determine what it is. You know elasticity is quite important, and typically that ends up being one of the public infrastructure service cloud providers. So not their own sort of on-prem, um, but when you get that same game title and it becomes more of a steady state, the economics do not favor keeping it there. And the effect is quite dramatic. Um, not in the case of NHN, but another one I can't get into specifics for. The, the cost differential is actually about 10x in terms of leaving it in the public cloud or repatriating it back on-prem. And OpenStack is used as the means to provide a common API between the public infrastructure as a service capability and the on-prem. Uh, you know, I think you probably see a lot of this here at the, at, uh, the summit uh, this time here in Vancouver. Uh, folks that are talking about uh, increasingly the ability to use OpenStack as a facility to like move data or, or to, to have kind of a common abstraction across many clouds, uh, whether it be perhaps uh, Amazon uh, Web Services, wherein you, the OpenStack support for many of the EC, uh, AWS APIs, all the EC2, S3, EBS, so on and so forth, you can actually then host that, essentially impersonate that with OpenStack, or perhaps it's OpenStack to OpenStack Cloud. So this is an example uh, now, they, of course, actually do support, um, deploy some of their titles uh, on-prem first, but the inverse of what I just described is true. You can burst out to that public capability. And by the way, that, I should mention that that was an interesting scenario in which uh, we hadn't actually talked to them prior. Um, uh, started seeing them in some of the auto support data I mentioned earlier, and uh, it ballooned, it, or perhaps you could you'd say it bloomed into a pretty significant deployment for them. Um, at University of Melbourne, in particular I'm referring to the Nectar Research Cloud, they're, they're making use of the full set of NetApp capabilities to deliver a full portfolio of cloud services, block, object, and soon-to-be file. Uh, so just uh, to harken back to my earlier discussion around Swift on E-Series, they've got a multiple petabyte deployment, same scenario, they would have had to deploy 3x the number of, you know, the capacity of the objects they want to deliver. Instead, it's about 1.3x. So that's been a successful deployment since uh, some point in 2014. Uh, they started, however, with um, block storage with Cinder, and that's, uh, that's proliferated. They have both our 7-mode and clustered on tap deployed. And they're also going to be uh, one of the, uh, the folks, I think, that will, will come to the fore as one of the first min, uh, production Manila deployments. So, so um, you know, that, they, that's the intent they've expressed to us. So we've been working with, it, with them on that. Uh, so they're using the whole full suite of capabilities that I've described, block, object, and file. And then NetApp, I'd like to actually talk about us for a second. So you know, I, we come from the development organization, uh, and there is, in fact, a uh, uh, two really distinct sort of internal IT organizations at NetApp. A, uh, an engineering services uh, organization we're referring to as the Global Engineering Cloud, and there's a corporate IT, uh, classic or corporate IT function. In both cases, we have OpenStack initiatives underway. In the first case, the intent is to actually move uh, a fairly significant, by the way, I should mention 10,000 VMs is actually within a single site, so it's actually much larger than that. Uh, moving that to OpenStack over time. In this particular case, um, this is you know, an intent to move from a classic enterprise virtualization stack 
to more of a cloud construct, and in the process also perhaps uh, an intent to uh, create a little bit more of an advantageous um, licensing uh, scenario, where in, in fact we're avoiding lock-in. Uh, so this is a big effort, and so NetApp is in fact actually an open, I guess you could say NetApp is an open stack on NetApp deployer, uh, and uh, that will only grow here going forward. So just to cover briefly some of what we've been up to, um, and I'm not going to go through every one of these bullet points, primarily I just want to focus on Kilo. Uh, some of the capabilities that we delivered in that time frame, a uh, significant effort to mature Manila and in particular to try and make it as modularly independent as possible. We are seeing an increasing number of folks that will deploy elements of OpenStack independently of the whole. And I'm not suggesting that that's the, you know, that's the common case, but it's a growing uh, population. Uh, so, for example, there are a few places where, uh, you know, large, I guess you could say online auctions uh, uh, house, um, I guess they've been on stage with us before actually talking about this, so I can mention the name, eBay, will use uh, Cinder in places independently, the rest of OpenStack, uh, to, as a standardized block storage abstraction. You know, I want a vendor neutral open standard block storage API so that I can actually switch in, swap out uh, the implementation that makes the most sense without necessarily having to re-platform my, my uh, provisioning automation logic. Um, so we want to do the same thing with Manila. Uh, we also added in fiber channel support. That's in Kilo for most of the platforms. It's actually in, uh, for E-Series specifically, it is available on the NAPS GitHub repo, or I, rather I should say it will be available on the NAPS GitHub repo in a backported form for Kilo in the, in the next come couple of weeks. We've actually done the engineering work, just haven't done the backport and got it pushed up yet, but that's essentially done. Uh, we also delivered a generic Cinder NFS backup driver. So if you're familiar or not, uh, Cinder has a basic backup facility where you can take a Cinder volume and push it to Swift, or actually I think there's some vendors like TSM, for example, that have options. Well, now there's a generic NFS capability. And in the future, we'll offer a more optimized means of using, for example, NetApp's ONTAP or our ONTAP product uh, to facilitate a, you know, a more efficient transport underneath that. But uh, that's a cool capability. Any, any NFS capable box can actually be a capable box can be a sender backup target now. So that's something NetApp developed and made available to the entirety of the community. It's not just an NetApp specific um, driver. We also contributed to the community a pretty significant enhancement to the to the security model for Cinder. Uh, this is uh, definitely something I would look long and hard at if you are using any of the NFS derivative drivers is moving to Kilo, um, it's, uh, it's a, a much more by design uh, secure uh, construct than it had been prior. We've added some, uh, what we refer to as storage service catalog enhancements. So earlier I described how in Cinder you can you know, advertise unique characteristics of backends to the Cinder scheduler. Well that same construct applies to Manila and in both cases we've added enhancements. In particular for E-Series with Cinder and with Manila, we've added basic, uh, a lot of enablement for our clustered on tap uh, Manila drivers. We've added manage unmanaged capability and we also uh, improved upon live migration stability in the Kilo release. And this is just highlights, there's been quite a lot more that occurred. Uh, case in point, I got these uh, metrics actually about a month and a half old, but this was uh, I think mostly applicable during the uh, during the Kilo development cycle, if you're not familiar, there was a requirement to actually move to kind of a vendor-driven uh, continuous integration sort of uh, automated testing harness that has to live in relation to the upstream. So just an example of some of the scale of the effort just for our, our Cinder, Cinder activity. This is none of the Manila activity in that time frame. Now NetApp is not a full stack provider, and we don't intend to be. So we partner pretty aggressively uh, with best-in-class vendors. Uh, we're upstream, so we'll work with any of the distributions that are OpenStack low compatible, uh, but it's not to say that we don't work more closely with a, with a number of parties, and certainly Red Hat, Mirantis, SUSE, and Rackspace have been uh, long-standing partnerships in the OpenStack ecosystem. Uh, we've built some reference architectures for Red Hat and SUSE. Uh, we have a validated architecture that will combine Cisco with Red Hat, I'll talk about in just a second. And I, I want to point out that our generalized reference architecture is applicable to Ubuntu um, as well. And then we're also doing some work with automation partners, presently uh, Puppet Labs and Chef, but possibly expand upon that here in the, uh, going forward. 
Uh, the, the thing I've kind of been alluding to just a little bit is, is FlexPod. FlexPod is fairly well known in traditional enterprise IT circles. This is a converged infrastructure architecture. It's a validated architecture in which we provide technology and architectural updates. In this particular case, it's a collaboration underway between Red Hat, NetApp, and Cisco. Uh, it is not yet shipping, so uh, I don't want to get into the specifics of when. Uh, but I think it's sufficient to say that this validation exercise is underway and we expect some news soon. So, uh, Brendan, please take, a, take us away. Thanks, Rob. That was really useful. So, I'm going to wrap up the presentation here. I, am, I just want to reiterate that uh, we feel very strongly that enterprise storage does have a role uh, in OpenStack. Um, and this is why we've been investing so heavily in uh, contributing to the community, uh, working with partners to build some of those reference architectures. And looking forward for us, this is going to become more and more important to our business. Um, so some of the takeaway points uh, uh, before I finish this. Uh, we have a broad portfolio. Uh, Rob went through a lot of this that is fully OpenStack enabled. Um, we are looking to continue this community commitment and this partnership uh, in engagement in the ecosystem. And we're going to continue adding features and future releases um, for future OpenStack uh, 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 versions and summits. So if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about what we do or follow us, um, we're putting all our information on our GitHub site. Uh, this allows us to be a lot more um, agile and reactive to the community. We have a, a community engagement forum on there. We have our deployment guide, which I encourage everybody to download uh, and take a look at. Um, and we're going to continue adding more and more material in this as, as we move forward. You can follow us at OpenStack NetApp. Um, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like to see anybody with any questions um, either come to us now or visit us on our website. Uh, but one last thing I do want to say, I look forward to seeing everybody in Tokyo um, in a few months from now. And uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions? I have a question about uh, this set versus enterprise storage. Sure. So I've been walking around the show floor, and a lot of people are wondering where's, where's the fit for set and where's the fit for enterprise storage? And will set ever get to a point where enterprise storage becomes just you know, basically a bunch of lines of code base storage? So, what are your thoughts on? So I, I think uh, I, I like the way you characterize it because I think that's a good way of putting it, Ceph versus enterprise, meaning Ceph is not nearly enterprise ready in many ways. Um, Ceph is a more nascent capability. Um, for those not familiar, kind of a distributed, I, a distributed storage um, capability, um, some of, a, of which actually exist in upstream Linux. Uh, you could take like a, a pool of, of systems uh, compute systems and kind of knit them together into a collective and vend them via a couple of different protocols. So it's, it's popular, I think, to get started with a lot of OpenStack clouds uh, because there's not a lot of, you know, sort of friction actually getting, uh, acquiring it and putting it into place. Um, I, there's, I guess I liken Ceph to kind of the classic Gartner hype cycle of innovation. If you're not familiar, there's basically this peak of expectations followed by a trough of disillusionment, followed by a slow ramp towards, you know, productive use. And there are different people in this community in different places. In fact, I think we've heard some stories who are kind of on that ramp into productive use, and they've characterized where it does and doesn't go. There's some real performance considerations. There's some things that it does not do well from a performance perspective. There's a certain type of SLA, uh, a resiliency requirement. Uh, so resiliency is probably not the right way of putting it, but you know, continuous availability, uh, you know, durability of data are architecturally provided for in Ceph, but in reality have proven to be problematic. Examples, uh, I encourage you to Google the term Cephpocalypse. For that matter, I can offer anecdotally folks who've you know, kind of struggled with like corrupted crush map that got replicated everywhere, which equates to poof, my data's gone. So Ceph is real, Ceph has uh, relevance in a certain sort of strata, uh, you know, within that catalog construct I talked about. It, it, you know, you would put certain volume types um, and associate it with it, I think, reasonably. But for anything that you put a, a higher SLA on it, I would, I would, I would advise a lot of caution.
Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And um, I hope you stick around. We have uh, 10 more sessions today. Um, I think eight more in here, plus a few more somewhere else. So uh, I hope to see you around. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks.